Thank you. So I'd like to ask a question uh, today, uh, which is what's the role played by fossil fuel sector in shaping people's attitudes towards climate change? Uh, and especially when it comes to uh, uh, employment in those sectors, because a lot of people work in fossil fuels, and uh, fossil fuels, that, that is a big part of the climate problem. So how do you talk about it when, for example, your neighbor works on uh, oil, oil recovery or maximizing oil production? Um, I, c I represent the Bergen Program on Governance and Climate, which is an interdisciplinary research program at the University of Bergen and the Norwegian School of Economics. And you may also be familiar with the Bjarknes Center for Climate Research. Um, so we do all kinds of climate related uh, research, uh, including uh, mitigation. My field is really mitigation policy and public opinion. I'm by training a political scientist, but I did take physics through high school, so I, I, I'm able to follow at least <laughs> some of the jokes that have been made here. <laughs> so uh, to start with my conclusions, uh, employment, yes, it matters for uh, opinion about climate change. Uh, and this is very important for climate science communication, including the working group three kind of mitigation policy communication, because employment, uh, we know that, that's one of the top three concerns of people of all times. So it's really important to, to keep that in mind. So, how do we explain public opinion on climate change? There is quite a literature, and some of you in the audience contribute to that literature, um, and the information deficit model has already been brought up, and I, couldn't, I wasn't able to change my slides uh, after Gavin Schmidt's uh, talk earlier, but the information deficit model is an important, it is, it is correct, it's there, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a basic hypothesis, which is true, it just doesn't tell you the whole story. So, starting from that, People like Malka Krosnick et al., many others, uh, show how knowledge is also mediated through uh, trust uh, in scientists and also party identification ideology and so on to produce concern. Um, we also know that uh, more on the psychological side, that worldview, so are you an egalitarian, are you a hierarchical individualist, or what, what are you, that also influences your view on climate change. So those are all individual, oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to, uh, huh, excuse me, I'm, I failed to go through this. Um, so the conclusions and uh, yes, so th those three top explanations are all at the individual level. We also have aggregate level uh, explanations. Um, the more anthropological, society level, how society teaches you what to ignore. Um, if you see that attitudes and uh, um, actions uh, differ, then you throw away the attitudes. No, you throw away the actions, of course. Um, and also we have some economic uh, aggregate variables. Uh, economic output has been shown by some, or argues by some, to influence concern with climate change. M more uh, unemployment, the Great Recession, uh, may have reduced concern. Although some say that, like Brule, that it, that's not really what does it. Communication, uh, leadership, and polarization among elites is really what drives it. So there is uh, still a debate going on on that. Uh, we know about fossil fuel industry organizations, their influence, and also conservative think tanks have an influence, uh, as you, you all know very well. But also from the more political science point of view, um, Craig and Khan show that uh, voting in the US Congress uh, is influenced by how much fossil fuel employment there is in the district. So you're less likely as a Congress person to vote for, for example, cap and trade if you have a lot of fossil fuel industry in your district. Makes sense. Similarly, this, um, the uh, Voluntary Cities for Climate Protection um, Coalition is something that cities are less likely to join if they have a lot of fossil fuel uh, employment in the cities. Also makes sense in terms of uh, economics. But we don't have any individual level uh, data showing the effect on individual employment in, oh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm very sorry about this. I should, I, I should go to this one instead. Um, so we, we, do, we do have uh, uh, several models showing the influence of uh, fossil fuel employment, and we have aggregate data on it. We, we don't have both. We don't have the individual level determinants of fossil fuels uh, and, and employment there. So which is why we go to Norway which is a great place to experiment with these things because 8% of the jobs in Norway are somehow linked to oil and gas, directly or indirectly. 
uh, as this graph shows. So uh, Norway is, is not just uh, convenient for me, but it's also, I think, a, a really good laboratory. And I think uh, we can find some generalizable results from, from Norway. So to uh, gauge public opinion about climate change, uh, we created an index. Um, my co-author and I, and my co-author is listed in the program, I think. Um, so we did the three types of statements about climate change. The, uh, the trend, is it happening? The attribution, is it human-made? And uh, the uh, impact, is it bad? Uh, and then we also did one positive and one negative, or statement of each, and then we made it into one big index, uh, which runs from one to five, from uh, absolute agreement to absolute disagreement, and then we uh, created a uh, nice distribution of responses going from pure skepticism, that, that's one on the scale, to uh, a complete concern or uh, acceptance, on, which is five. And then you have perfect agnosticism in the middle, which is, is the value of three. And you see that the Norwegian uh, um, general attitude is skewed towards concern. Um, the mean here is 3.7, so it's, it's a bit more than agnosticism. It's more like I, I somewhat agree that this is a problem that's happening. It's, uh, it's human-made when you take everything together. Um, and I, I haven't changed this, but I, I, I haven't compared it to other countries, but I'd love to do that. So if you have data, if you know of data, let me know, so, because this would, it would be nice to try this elsewhere. So what are the results? Um, I'll go straight at it. Uh, this graph shows uh, the mean, that's the red line, uh, the 3.7, and we also have the energy sector employment with a uh, mark there, which shows that there is a one-third of a point lower, uh, or more agnosticism among people working in the oil and gas industry in Norway. Everything else equal. Uh, so we check for things like education, um, gender, age, um, also knowledge about climate change. We also test for ideology. And these are, these are not actual numbers, but these are uh, simulated uh, results. But uh, at least they show you also for other groups that, for example, transport, uh, transportation sector workers are also less likely to be worried about climate change, whereas teachers are slightly more uh, inclined to, to accept the messages. Um, so as expected, one third more agnosticism or, or less accept uh, among the energy sector employment. That's not really a lot. It's like moving from uh, somewhat agree to uh, neither agree nor disagree on two of those six uh, um, questions. But still, it is a significant result. And um, it, it is as, as expected. So, but could this be just something about ideology? Could it be the fact that uh, uh, people in the sector are just taking cues from politicians that they vote for that they agree with. And actually, I did, we did test that, and we find out that it doesn't really make a big difference. If you include, for example, three party groups, left, right, center, it doesn't really change the result very much, and I apologize for not having a graph for that. But again, you show that uh, the, the coefficient here again shows that it is about one-third of a point uh, below mean if you are in the, in the sector. Uh, whether you voted for a party on the right or the left, uh, that really is controlled for. So there, is, there remains a residual and significant effect of employment in the sector. Uh, we also, I, I'll just skip this. So I am, that's, that's the result, and I think uh, it would be nice uh, in future research to look more at the mechanisms behind this, because one thing could be just um, your um, pure economic interest. But a workplace is more than just your salary. It is a socialization process. It, it's a place where you um, meet a lot of people, you, you talk to people. And maybe this is not, it, it could also be corporate communication spreading um, certain ideas about climate change officially through a company website, but it doesn't have to be that. It could also be this, the fact that you work in a place that is somewhat at odds with the messages of the climate community. Uh, you may, you may not get more skeptical, but maybe you get mobilized. So you want to cling to the agnostic messages, at least. So that would be nice to, to, to study more using different ways of uh, uh, types of inquiry. And also, I, I try to push some of you to get data from Alaska or Alberta or other uh, countries, or maybe one should oversample respondents in this industry. 
And also, I think it, uh, it matters what kind of job you have. Okay. Uh, so, for example, if you're a lawyer working in the oil industry, well, you could be a lawyer somewhere else. You work, you're an IT worker. It doesn't really matter where, where you work. But if you're an expert in drilling holes and getting out the black stuff from the ground, maybe it's not so easy to, uh, to have alternative av avenues, and maybe you would have a more, you know, greater inclination towards uh, agnosticism or even direct skepticism. So that, that would also be nice to test, although we don't really have the, uh, the granularity of the data yet to, to test that. So what are the implications for science communication? So w we know already, we've heard that we need to assert the correct information. It's probably a, a good idea. We also need to present science in a way that does not threaten any group's values. Now that is harder, because if you want to avoid climate change, it's very hard to uh, not uh, threaten the, some kind of value, some economic value for some people who work in getting uh, fossil carbon out and, and having it burned to, to hit the atmosphere. That, so that's a pretty hard one. Um, again, also, we, we should probably emphasize consensus, scientific consensus, but again, it doesn't change the fact that there is, you are fundamentally at odds with some economic values and some, also probably some social values involved in this. Um, so I think it is, and, and, and here I, I don't have, certainly don't have all the answers, but I think it's important to acknowledge that this is, there is a cost not just to climate change but also to mitigation. And these costs are not diffuse. They're not, they're not like Stern says, 1% of GDP. It's probably benefits for a lot of people and then they're pretty uh, concentrated costs for, for some people. And I think it's important to uh, stress that there are alternatives to this kind of employment. Uh, of course, that needs to be truthful, but we're not, we shouldn't just talk about employment in general. Gr a green economy is great. It will lead to all kinds of jobs. It needs to be specific. And of course, you, one needs to talk to people, but you've already said that, and uh, you, you also expect a Scandinavian to say that, wouldn't you? So, but let me be specific about the uh, mitigation or, or the mitigation options that uh, generate alternative routes of employment. And from the uh, North Sea oil perspective, uh, I think uh, geothermal energy is a very nice uh, type of mitigation that uh, could employ a lot of the expertise that's currently found in the oil industry. Uh, uh, so. Uh, Uni Research in Bergen has, uh, has a, an arm that does enhance oil recovery, but they also do geothermal. And the same people can do that. So that's an, I think that's a nice thing to talk about. Uh, carbon capture and storage, the, the second one there, is also, I think, politically a really nice thing to talk about. It may be slow, it may be expensive, it may be very problematic, but politically it's a good thing because it uses people's skills to drill holes and, ha and uh, use reservoirs. A lot of these skills are transferable into CCS. So I think that's also a nice thing to, to emphasize. It, it, it certainly makes sense politically. And finally, uh, the obligatory um, wind turbines. I, I think uh, that's also a, a really good uh, thing to talk about. Now I've chosen to take uh, floating uh, offshore wind because that's something that uses the offshore oil industry's uh, competence very well and indeed they also they are uh, they are competing for the same people and one of the big problems for the Norwegian offshore wind industry is that uh, they can't well I don't want to depress you but it's hard for them to compete with the oil industry but that, that may change and that's probably something we should also talk about thank you <laughs>